Hi, my name is Preston Sterling, and for my Physics 20D course in Space Science at UCI, I chose to do my extra credit assignment on the Star Destroyer collision in the Star Wars film Rogue One. First off, I looked up the Star Destroyer's length, which is 1600 meters long. Using the physics software tracker, I created a calibration stick of the same length. Next, I created a point mass and used the auto tracker feature to track the edge of the starship as it started falling towards the planet. I chose the edge because it was well defined, which would make it easier for the software to track. The software tracked every frame of the clip and using the plot feature on the panel on the right side of the workspace, I plotted the graph of y velocity versus time, the slope of which equaled negative 1.873 or the y component of the acceleration in meters per second squared. Next, I calculated the height of the Star Destroyer above the planet to verify that this gravitational acceleration was the appropriate value for the altitude. From the scene where the tower on the planet is destroyed by the blast of the Death Star, I used simple Newtonian kinematics to calculate the height of the tower based off the falling dust that is created when the tower is struck. In this clip, I did not use the tracker software because the dust cloud confused the auto tracker feature and the particle that I measured started out as part of the tower and was thus difficult to track from the beginning of the clip. Using a fairly accurate millimeter ruler, I measured the height of the tower on my computer screen, the initial and final positions of one fragment of debris, and the time elapsed. Solving the equations for the height of the tower, I concluded that the tower was very close to 378 meters tall, roughly equivalent to the height of the Bank of China Tower in Hong Kong. For the next step, I used the scene where Admiral Raddus looks down on the tower from space. I first used two still images to determine the size of the circular base relative to the tower's height. I then constructed two similar right triangles, one using lengths I measured using the ruler on my screen, and one with the actual tower's dimensions. One spaceship can be seen transiting the viewport of the bridge, which I identified as a 90 meter long rebel transport, according to the Star Wars wiki. I again constructed two similar right triangles, with the unknowns being the distances between the camera and the transport, and the knowns being the relative lengths of the shadow and transport. I solved the similar triangles using proportional fractions, and after roughly estimating the distance between the camera and the 90 meter transport as between 3 to 6 kilometers, I obtained an altitude of somewhere between 19.5 and 38.9 kilometers, which arguably is a large range, but I could only do so much with the very small amount of information provided, and, spoiler alert, the large range surprisingly did not change the outcome by much. Next, I used the gravitational acceleration formula to calculate the horizontal velocity of the station. I did this assuming the shield gate is portrayed in a geostationary location. It's always above a certain place on the planet and thus rotates around at the same angular velocity as the planet. At this altitude of 19.5 to 38.9 kilometers, I calculated that the velocity must be 466 meters per second minimum and 467 meters per second maximum. At this altitude, this velocity would be too slow for an actual orbit, which is why I don't call it a geostationary orbit. The spacecraft is simply levitating off the surface of the planet at a suborbital altitude. Assuming that the Star Destroyer lost its levitation power when it was disabled, it would still be traveling at the 466 meters per second horizontally and also begin to accelerate down. Drawing a free body diagram of the situation and plugging in the necessary values, I arrived at an acceleration of negative 9.7 to negative 9.74 meters per second squared at these specific altitudes, also accounting for the centripetal force from the sidewards velocity. This is far off from the negative 1.873 meters per second squared that was observed. But something wasn't adding up. Even the upper bound of the altitude that I calculated was less than half the definitive altitude for space, 100 kilometers. So I did more research online and consulted the Star Wars wiki, where I learned that Scarus radius was only three-fourths that of Earth's, so its acceleration due to gravity on the surface would be smaller. I calculated the mass of Scarif, assuming the same density as Earth, and also the acceleration due to gravity, which is equivalent to 7.01 meters per second squared. These calculations tell us that the acceleration due to gravity drops by a very small, almost negligible amount even when the altitude is raised tens of kilometers above the planet's surface. Therefore, this scene isn't scientifically accurate, as a free-falling object at this altitude would experience around three to four times the acceleration as depicted in the film. Thank you for watching.